Welcome back. In the last video, we talked about writing systems and how the type of writing system you use might influence how you provide input into the computer. We talked about alphabets and how sometimes they need diacritics, symbols that accompany the consonants or vowels. And then you might need to use a depth key to remap the keyboard so that, for example, if you press the accent key and an A, you get the actual glyph for the accented A. We looked at cursive systems, like the one for Arabic, where Unicode has to traverse the string to then select the correct form in which that character interacts with the other characters around it. We also looked at systems like Korean, where letters need to be in strict block forms, and the computer needs to be transforming the input into the correct configuration of those blocks. In this video, we're going to talk about more writing systems, syllabic alphabets, syllabaries, and logographic systems. So syllabic alphabets, or abugidas, are the type of writing used in most languages of India. In these languages, the consonants are a type of main symbol, a primary symbol, and vowels are secondary symbols, similar to the diacritics in the Roman alphabet. For example, this one here is the consonant k accompanied by an implicit a. So this would be read ka. This dash line here indicates a long a. So this is ka. This is the k accompanied by a short e. So this is ki. We have it here in b. This is the k accompanied by a long e. So this is ki. We have it here in B. Take a look at this. Not only are the, uh, the vowels like small secondary symbols that accompany the consonants, sometimes they can even come before the consonant, like in the, in the case of the short E, which graphically comes before the P symbol, even though it's pronounced P. Um, as you can see, there are independent symbols for the vowels when they occur on their own, but when they occur next to a consonant, they take this secondary form. This happens in many languages of India. As you can see, we have here many examples where you have, this is the equivalent of the K in the Vanagari. This is the system for Hindi. And this is the equivalent in other languages from India. And you have the consonant and then the accompanying vowel, in this case, for E. In this case, you would get the key for the letter K and then when you get the following symbol, the computer will recompute the correct uh, joining in between them. And even if you have the E, it will have to switch the symbols. It does it in a way similar to what we saw with the accents and the depth keys. So you would have a main key for your consonant, in this case, the Vanagari K, and then you would have depth keys that you press in order to get the different um, vowels that go above the letter or below the letter. Amharic, for example, is also a type of abugida. As you can see here, the letters have for a, a certain basic shape for all the consonants, and then they have special markings for the specific type of vowel that you have. As you can see, this is the K, and this is Ka, Ku, key, and so forth. There's a basic shape, but the, the, there's a secondary shape, which is used to mark the vowel. Um, as we can see here, uh, for example, we would press, this is uh, the combination for bo, bu. Um, we press the B letter, which is here in the W, uh, the, the W1 designated for English, and then the character that makes it an O, is here on this key. So you press first the consonant and then the vowel, and only then does the keyboard send the code, does the operating system transform this code into a specific uh, output code, into a graphic code. So first the B, and then nothing happens, and then the vowel, and then you have enough information to combine these into a display character. One quick note, there's keyboards that are not mechanical, that are graphical like the ones on our cell phones. In those keyboards, you don't usually have sequences of two presses, 
But what you usually have is something called a long press, where, for example, you have the basic shape of the consonant, and then you press it, and out pop the different options for the vowels. We use this in Spanish as well. You press on a vowel, and if you press on it, out comes the vowel with the accent, for example, or the vowel with the two dots. There's writing systems called syllabaries. For example, hiragana in Japanese, or the Cherokee syllabary. These are the hiragana symbols na, ni, nu, ne, no. As you can see, there's nothing in here that's n and n and a separately. The whole symbol is na. Like this here, the whole symbol is ni. There's nothing about here that is an n, and then we can separate it into an e. Likewise for the Cherokee symbols. One interesting issue about them is that there's, they're usually very numerous. So for Cherokee, this is about 80 syllables, and Japanese hiragana have about 45 symbols for each set, and there's two sets. So there's usually more symbols than keys, because there's more syllables than letters in, in language. And so what people do is that they have a certain set of the characters in what we would call the lower case, and then the shift, for example, would engage a different mapping to have another layer of characters. So, for example, this one would be the active character in the without the shift, and this would be the character with the shift pressed. And that way you can fit all of the 80 plus symbols of Cherokee into a keyboard. And then the mother of uh, writing systems, logographic systems. These started out as hieroglyphs in Egyptian, Maya, and Chinese glyphs. As you can see, many of them were indeed drawings at the beginning. So for example, here we have a little horse from Ma, which was pronounced Mra, uh, you know, 3,000 years ago. And this little drawing of a horse changed over time until it became this modern character. This little drawing of a mountain here changed Sran at first, and now Shan changed until it's become this. One quick note, only about 10% of the modern characters of Chinese started out as hieroglyphs. Most of them are now combinations, where a part of the character tells you a little bit about the meaning, and another part tells you a little bit about the sound. So it is not true that all of the characters come from hieroglyphs. Only a very small percentage, about 10%, do come from hieroglyphs. But this is how uh, these writing systems began. And that now they can have hundreds of uh, characters, even thousands of characters. And one thing when you have so many characters is that then you can write a word in more than one way. This is the hieroglyphic system for Maya. Mayan glyphs are very interesting in that there's both glyphs that have just meaning, like this uh, one that's pronounced Balam, this is a jaguar, and there's glyphs that are syllables. This one here is ba la m. So this is one way to write jaguar, and this is another way to write jaguar. But in the middle, there's other alternatives. For example, you could have the glyph for the syllable ba, then the drawing of the jaguar, and then the syllable m. This is not pronounced ba ba lam. This is pronounced balam. What these glyphs are doing here is providing the scribe with a little reminder that that word begins with a ba and ends with an m. Likewise, in this one, this is pronounced balam, and this is a reminder to the scribe that the, words begin, the word begins with a ba. So all of these are valid ways to write a word in Mayan hieroglyphs. The same thing happened in Egyptian hieroglyphs, for example. There were many alternative ways to write a word, and the same thing happens in modern Japanese. For example, this word on the left is Japanese language, Nihongo. And on the keyboard, you would write it in the uh, Latin transcription, N-I-H-O-N-G-O, -O and then your keyboard will display something like this. Your screen uh, will display three options, the one with Chinese characters, the one with the hiragana syllabary, and the one in the katakana uh, syllabary. And then you need to manually select which one you want, because those three are perfectly valid ways to write the same word. 
What this is called is an input method editor, which is needed when systems have so many alternatives because maybe you write an alternative in, within one style and maybe the, you need a different alternative for the following paragraph and so forth. The syllable show, for example, can be written in 95 different ways. And this is where an input method editor will be really necessary. This is an example of an input method editor for uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs. And the main um, orthographic principle for Egyptian characters was achieving balanced squares. So characters, uh, sorry, hieroglyphs would need to be reshaped and resized. And there's computer systems to help you do this. But as you can see, there's a lot of manual work involved. And so you need additional help other than just, you know, hitting the key. One final thing. Languages use different directions for writing. In English, we write from left to right, all of the lines. In languages like Hebrew or Arabic, the writing is done from right to left. All of the lines are written this way. There's uh, languages like Mongolian or Chinese that also have a direction called top to bottom. Whereas you can see the sentences start at the top, and sorry, this goes this way, and start at the bottom. Unicode supports those three directions, left to right, right to left, and top to bottom. And the, um, the different characters have metadata for which of the directions they should be going in. There's two directions that Unicode does not support. For example, Bustrophedon. This one's really cool. You, uh, for example here, you start the line from right to left, and when you hit the end of the line, you go left to right, and then you hit the end of the line and you go right to left again, and you hit the end of the line and you go uh, left to right. Bustrophedon means hitting the end and then starting in the opposite direction. Ancient Greek uh, was written like this. As you can see, some types of runes were written like this, and but Unicode does not support it. Finally, your direction could be variable. Egyptian hieroglyphs have this very cool feature. Take a look at this little cat, at the little bird, at the little guy over there, at the eagle. What direction are they facing? They all have faces. Where are they looking? They're looking towards the left. They're, so this is where the line begins. The hieroglyphs are looking at the beginning of the line. So this line should be read from left to right. On the one at the bottom, the cat, the little bird, the eagle are looking towards the right. So the line needs to be read from right to left. And this was very useful when decorating doors, for example. So you could have text in both directions. Unicode does not support this style of writing. All right. So this was a short summary of the types of writing systems we have in the world and of the many challenges we have when we try to write a language in a computer. Maybe we have more characters than there are keys. There's so many characters in Chinese and Japanese that we need some additional method to input them. In this case, they use the most used method is to use a Roman transcription, for example, uh, the Japanese words in Latin letters, and then have an additional input menu that says, lets you select the correct character. Uh, letters may change shape as you type, as was the case with Arabic, where a letter that is initial is different from a letter that is in the middle. And then Unicode runs a dynamic algorithm that changes the shape as you go. Maybe you need additional markings, like in the accents of Spanish or the vowels of a bugidas. And then as you type, the keyboard is going to change mappings depending on the dead keys that you hit. And um, there might be some additional code running, making sure that you have the correct combinations. Maybe characters will fit together in complex ways, like Rian Hangul, and the system always has to be checking what possible combinations could there be for the uh, letters that you typed to replace them for the correct format. Maybe systems have different writing directions, and you have English and Arabic in the same line, and the computer has to um, decide how to format it. Maybe you have more than one way to type a word, as we saw with Japanese and Maya. And again, you would need some sort of additional input support to do that. So as you can see, a lot of cool things happening with writing systems. In the next video, we will take a short look at how the computer encodes all of these characters.